looking at the city of Cincinnati and the food deserts within it. In the city of Cincinnati, there are seven pockets of Hamilton County recognized as food deserts by the United States Department of Agriculture. They are as follows. Witten Hills, the West End, Bond Hill, South Fairmont, Camp Washington, and Avondale. Residents in these seven neighborhoods face one of the greatest challenges that confronts Cincinnati families every day. Obtaining healthy food on a regular basis is not easy and becomes a challenge the community must confront together. Hunger. The painful sensation that someone feels on a regular basis due to lack of food is a relatively rare phenomenon in America today, but it nevertheless afflicts a small number of U.S. residents on an intermittent basis. In the seven pockets previously mentioned in Cincinnati, residents do have access to food, but the food used to fill the hunger void is not generally the best choice. Large tracts of Hamilton County are food deserts. Each pink tract represents an area categorized as a food desert. While there are numerous variations for the term food desert, for Cincinnatians, a food desert is defined as a low-income neighborhood with limited access to nutritious and affordable foods. Access. The United States Department of Agriculture statistically claims that if a citizen lives within a one-mile radius of a grocery store, that individual does not live in a food desert. However, what the USDA fails to take into account is a one-mile radius does not translate well geographically, unless each citizen has a private plane they can fly to the grocery store. The one-mile radius definition is useful, but not practical. While a person living in Avondale may appear to live only one mile from the closest grocery store, it may take them more than four miles to either drive or walk to the grocery store using the street grid that designs the city. Most individuals in food desert areas do not have access to transportation, which makes it even more difficult to travel outside the city to purchase healthy food. It takes the average individual 15 to 20 minutes to walk a full mile. Even individuals who do live exactly within a one mile walking distance of the grocery store are forced to carry or lug their groceries home without the luxury of an automobile to carry them for them. Walk or bike to the grocery store in the snow or the rain. Feel motorists inch towards your bike as you balance a 50 pound duffel bag of groceries. Finding healthy food is dangerous, time consuming, and inconvenient. What the definition also lacks to accentuate is the overabundance of unhealthy food choices that bombard citizens in recognized food desert areas. These large and often isolated geographic areas lack fresh, nutritious food which is inaccessible due to physical or economic barriers. Convenience stores are heavily populated in food desert areas. They lack healthy food, not liking produce since it spoils if not sold quickly. Stores rarely sell fresh food, and even if they do, it's at inflated prices and generally poor quality. Fast food restaurants promise the same immediate satisfaction. Whether it's taste or the guarantee of a cheap dollar menu, Fast food restaurants are overrepresented in impoverished areas. When individuals purchase fast food, they send their money out of the community, leaving the area even further impoverished. After reading Richard Register's Eco City, I was particularly taken by his imaginative bike tour, so I decided to embark on one of my own in search of Cincinnati Garden Space. I started in my own neighborhood, North Avondale, and found two public areas that could be seen as gardens. One is a roundabout teeming with diverse and vibrant plant life. My next door neighbor tends to it in addition to her front yard. Weeks back, I was at a local fundraiser and saw the food tables lined with vases of flowers from Ursula's garden. It became clear that even the private garden is not something to be kept hidden. 
but it's to be shared. Down the street, a minivan pulls up to Dr. Farnsworth's house, and out jumps a girl in her Sunday dress. I sit and watch as she explores in search of volunteer flowers that collectively give the lawn a purple tinge. I was assured that no one would come bursting out of the house to stop the girl from picking flowers. Maybe Michael Pollan was right, that the front yard serves a purpose for the public, and when the garden is involved, people will come out to play. As I took off down Dana, I came across a triangle median, its perimeter lines with beds of bushes and flowers. I stopped by to ask a lady spraying weed killer on a large shrub about the space. Mary, another neighbor who lives just one street over, expressed with pride that for 27 years North Avondale residents have been taking care of these rows. When the city cited expensive upkeep as the reason to convert this area into uniform grass lawn, residents objected with their participation to tend to it together. For North Avondale, the Dana Gardens has served as a gateway entrance to the community, but is also a place that has historically been central to civic and social life. I traveled up to Xavier's Nexus Garden, into Norwood, and then took flight down Gilbert Avenue to over the Rhine, but not before stopping by the hub of innovation in gardening activity, the Civic Garden Center. The garden is hardly a new function of the city. The CGC was founded in 1942 and still exists as an oasis bordering the eight-acre Hoke Botanical Garden in Clifton. Since 1981, the Neighborhood Gardens Program has been helping communities to convert underutilized lots into beautiful and productive vegetable gardens and green spaces. There are currently over 45 community and youth gardens, all connected through a common network across Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky urban spheres. Today, these combined efforts produce well over 14,000 pounds of food annually. I guess the name Civic Garden Center speaks for itself. It is a place where people come together to engage with one another and the land. I bumped into an avid gardener who shared with me some of her thoughts of why she thought the garden was important. I get the feeling that I'm part of it. I'm part of nature, I'm part of it. And the garden is just a, a garden is something that I feel has human hands. It's, it's very practical, but it's also very symbolic about neighbors coming together um, to really care for themselves. Given the reality of food deserts and health disparities, Gabriel's Place is a not-for-profit that helps create access to affordable fresh food in Avondale. The once vacant Episcopalian Church in Lot. Destined for Blight is now the site for a community garden and indoor market center. This year is their first growing season, with nine beds planted. Two have been donated to residents in the community who cannot, for time or ability, come and garden themselves. With an industrial kitchen and aquaponic system that raises tilapia and a cycle along with greens, community members are offered skills with technical and natural knowledge to become producers of their own food from start to finish. Reflecting on my travels thus far, made me realize how fragile urban gardening movements truly are. Spatially, these areas grow from donation of both land and capital, and are generally relegated to marginal communities. However, industrial agriculture is subsidized just the same by preferential government policies and cheap oil. I am reminded of Lewis Mumford's approach to constructing the city. He says, the incalculable element in every scheme for urban and regional planning is not what men have and are accustomed to, but what they want and are ready when the want has been organized and dramatized to reach for. It seems like every year there's a, a, that situation comes when there's more plants than there is dirt. There's more help than there is things to attend. I personally, you know, I think I think the whole carrying of the plant from the get-go is like, it's not a race. Spending nearly four hours down at the Liberty and Elm Garden with Denny was truly an enlightening experience. Still a country boy, he commutes to the city to be a part of a coalition of farmers like Charles Griffin and organizations like Finley Martin. When I asked him what he liked most about gardening and OTR, he answered, it's what we're doing right here, sitting down with a cup of coffee and a conversation. If Denny is right, then Cincinnati will serve its function as a city and become a central conglomeration of farm and garden knowledge, tools, and techniques. The place to be if you want to plant seed. 
Although this particular garden thrives as a direct investment from Finley, other urban farmers are seeking new and creative means to produce and distribute locally. Urban Greens LLC operates as a CSA. While breaking into oversaturated markets has been challenging for urban gardeners, the CSA offers an alternative space for market exchange. The site of production and consumption converge. Consumers are part producers as sweat equity accompanies payment for a 25-week long food share. F.F. Shoemaker echoes the real relationship that exists between producer and consumer. He says, man as producer and man as consumer is in fact the same man who is always producing and consuming at the same time. We are a, a for-profit LLC, but obviously we're not going for mega profits. What we're trying to do is show that urban agriculture revolution can be a sustainable way to revolutionize the food choices of people in America. Looking back on my bike tour investigation of Cincinnati Gardens, it was not quite as leisurely or short like Register might have envisioned, but I did get to see the various ways that the gardens are integrated into the city. The garden serves as a source of economic development, specifically as a food replacing system. Instead of people flocking to supermarkets, fast food restaurants, or convenience stores that offer food from thousands of miles away with little homogeneous nutritional value. The garden offers high energetic, unique foods whose patronage ensures enduring economic vitality. The garden offers both real and symbolic fertility in its presence, thus discouraging the advancement of blight. The garden can serve as a resource for community building that holds people together aesthetically and civically. Finally, the garden is a space for learning and advancement of knowledge. Gardens are not one-dimensional, but rely upon active collaboration between humanity and nature. In fact, if we were to survive, we need to learn how to foster our relationship with Mother Earth. I'm reminded of something a professor once said in class. Unless you take some interest in the future, in shaping the world around you, I am not sure that you are truly human. As Austin led us to consider, the challenge of accessibility to good, healthy food does involve basic components like supply and demand. These components are important. One important question, though, is what if the supply chain breaks down at any point, beyond food deserts and into a wider urban area? Would Cincinnati have the capacity to scale up local production in a meaningful way without a massive crisis? This may sound unrealistic or too philosophical, not to mention dreamy, but a practical example may help to illustrate this point. In 2000, in the UK, Truck drivers across their society went on strike. Within the space of three days, the UK economy was brought to the brink, as it became clear that the country was about a day away from food rationing and civil unrest. Shortly before the dispute was resolved, Sir Peter Davis, the chairman of Sainsbury's, sent a letter to Tony Blair saying that food shortages would appear in, quote, days rather than weeks. So again, we ask, and practically, if the supply chain breaks down at any point, would Cincinnati have the capacity to scale up and meet our food challenges? And where, if not in a series of small garden plots, with master gardeners and urban farmers, would this food come from? Rob Hopkins, in his book, The Transition Handbook, calls this ability resilience, the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change so as to still retain essentially the same function, structure, identity, and feedbacks. Austin's bicycle tour hopefully drew our interest away from a cold economic assessment of the challenges and into the series of tiny actions on the behalf of many citizens to build our capacity for basic food and the relational networks needed to hold us in times of crisis. It is clear that we need a mixture of solutions to the food challenges our city faces. We need every piece from grassroots actions to more entrenched nonprofits to city regulations and resolutions that empower a greater sense of community. In just a bit, Kelsey will address the civic actions in recent memory that enhance accessibility of good food. First, though, Nathan interviewed two urban farmers in Norwood. Robert and Aaron Lockridge, that last growing season worked on three different plots in the West Norwood neighborhood. The total amount of space that they worked 
amounted to about a third of an acre of land, which gives us a strong glimpse into the capacity of small urban plots to help feed us. A strong element that Robert and Aaron bring with them also is a warning that if cities are to build their capacities to raise lots of food, we need to avoid the mistakes our wider food system constantly makes. Seeing soil and farmland as expendable, pounding the soil with fertilizers, pesticides, and huge machinery. As we listen to their way, consider the twin questions. How might we in the city learn from the mistakes of industrial farming? And instead of immediately striving for the biggest production of food, might our approach instead choose to embrace limits? As many gardeners find, the better the soil and the more ripe the vegetable, the better the taste and the nutrients contained within. Let us listen to Robert and Aaron. We, the temptation we struggle with is to come in and say, we're going to save the neighborhood through our work by loving or, or feeding or whatever. Um, but I think we've been humbled time and time again that we're not doing anything grand, you know, on at least on a scale that is perceivable. And it's, it's like we are, as we tend the land, we ourselves are tended. And that's, in some days, all that we do. Like, that's all that it feels like we're doing, is it's kind of this, um, kind of a cultivation of our own souls. But um, I think the prayer is that as we do that work, mm -hmm. it, um, just in the same way that if you plant, you know, one plant in a patch of really stripped soil, that one plant is going to um, create a little culture around itself in the soil. And worms will come and the other microorganisms organisms will come and, and that soil will start to be transformed there. Um, but that will kind of grow out, you know, just by tending this one small place. You can, you know, kind of develop a culture from that. And I think in some ways that's a prayer as we work in the neighborhood that, you know, we're not out to save the world. We're not even out to save the neighborhood. You know, we're, we're out to just to worship God. You know, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I think when, when we focus on outcomes, when we, when we kind of dream up something and imagine what, how that could change the world, then I think we're, we're starting in the wrong place. Because then we're, we're then trying to force everything that comes our way into that goal or that outcome, mm -hmm. rather than receiving receiving the gifts of the day. Like we're making we're we're making people into objects. We're making gardens into you know we're we're going to press the land into service of some end, or we're going to press people. How many pounds of food would you estimate you grew last year that you harvested? Just ballpark. Mm, you're better so at that. Hard. Can we say it in a different measure than pounds? Mm -hmm. We grew enough to um, provide a weekly meal to a community house of 12 people and weekly CSA shares to uh, 18 to 22 people, kind of depending on the week. Um, and For an 18 week period. Right. For an 18 week period. Um, to feed a wedding ceremony, or a reception of 300 people and to eat on it all winter. We're still eating a lot of it. And then several other just kind of um, group meals um, through, you know, got groups that would come to the neighborhood for this or that. Um, yeah, different groups. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard. I don't know. I don't know how to put a poundage to it. I mean, we. Yeah, poundage might not might not have been the best way. But it was kind of like searching for ways to to quantify mm -hmm. quantify. Well. I mean, after all of that, we still have a cupboard full of winter squash. 
Um, Two freezers full. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how many how many pounds of, you know, it would depend on the crop. We still have two hundred leeks to pull. We still have like we're we're cooking a meal tomorrow, and it'll all be from the garden from last year's harvest that we're still still picking now. Um, we probably grew. 1,500 pounds of tomatoes. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how. Yeah, I just wanted to, to like bring. I just wanted to bring that. A, th a thousand beets. I mean. Um, but, yeah. I don't know. One of the reasons I wanted to to say that though is just I find it I find it interesting that um, you are you are focusing on the small things or choosing to uh, you could say like focusing on the mm. spiritual discipline of mm. of limits of not pressing the land too too much mm. of not pressing yourselves of uh, finding limits within yourselves um, and of of not living with an overly idealized version of what you think you desire to accomplish and yet, um, mm. and yet there was this bountiful harvest that resulted from it, and I just find that mm. I find that interesting. It seems to me that um, some of the people who are the most idealistic in the world are maybe the least productive, mm. and um, I find it interesting and meaningful that as you are seeking the significance of small things, as you are seeking to learn the value and efficiency. Um, and choosing to embrace limits that you could reap such a bountiful harvest. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. strictly speaking about um, the harvest, the vegetable harvest that came. And then you tack on on top of that mm -hmm. the relational harvest, the, mm -hmm. the inner transformation harvest, the, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the time to actually listen to the birds. And mm -hmm. to observe the lilies, or mm -hmm. um, that that I find deeply meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I think we struggled every week. Like we never really learned our lesson. Um, every week when we would be hard, we'd get up early on a Tuesday morning to harvest for that night's CSA pickup, and we would think, "What do we have to harvest this week?" It's it's. You know, I don't think it's going to be enough. People are going to be disappointed, and maybe you know, maybe some people were. But at, at, at the end of every day, every <laughs> that aside, what is a Ruta Vega? <laughs> right. What do I do with this? More chard. Yeah. But um, but there was always such a spread at the end of all of that, and we were always like, oh, yeah, that's... and we we completely felt, yeah. I mean, not to be like overly pious, but we were, mm -hmm. we were, we definitely felt like that was such a gift. The city of Cincinnati is actively working to make citizens food conscious. Mobile produce food trucks are posted in Cincinnati neighborhoods. For individuals unable to go to healthy food, the City of Cincinnati is ensuring it can be brought to them. Trucks being stationed in Cincinnati neighborhoods operate on weekday hours Monday through Friday, generally 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. daily, to accommodate citizens. The trucks carry an array of locally grown healthy foods, providing citizens and neighborhoods with healthy choices. Educational performance has been linked to food consumption. Consuming unhealthy foods deteriorates health and cognitive performance. To ensure school-aged children are receiving the healthiest food, children in some Cincinnati public schools are given free or reduced school breakfast and or lunch. During the school year, children consume at least two healthy meals, which helps prepare them to receive their education. And parents who pick up their children from school can purchase $5 produce bags on Fridays. Some Cincinnati residents live in areas with poor access to healthy food, and an abundance of unhealthy food options. 
Yet the city is working diligently to unite the communities and promote a healthier food ethic. Organizations such as Closing the Health Gap are unveiling the malnourishment of the inner city and encouraging an ethic of food consciousness. The community must want change, but as human beings have displayed before, we can transform the environment in a positive way, and the city of Cincinnati is determined to positively transform food deserts.